The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Bless the family, the finances. Actually, I want to bless the seven internal mountains of every member that's here. You know, this, you know, we talk about the seven mountains in society. There's a seven internal mountain, and that is spirit rule, mind that is renewed in the spirit of our minds, our will yielded and totally surrendered to the lordship of Jesus, our emotions in constant communion with the fruit of the spirit and the person of the Lord Jesus. All of our possessions totally consecrated to Him. That's your gifts, your talents, your finances, everything. All possessions. And then lastly, your physical body for Christ the healer to rise up and have dominion. Jennifer and I are in better health in our 70s than we were in our 40s. Well, she's not in her 70s yet, but anyway. Well, boy, why be in trouble with that one, huh? Yikes. Uh oh. <laughs> But nevertheless, um, I can't fix that now. <laughs> I can't. So leave it alone, right? If you can't fix it, leave it. Um, also, all relationships. Something that, uh, that we cover a lot is on the forgiveness message and repentance and forgiveness and the necessity of it. In this, especially in this hour, always, but in this hour. And <clears throat> the one thing that no amount of repentance can accomplish. Isn't that a curious statement? No amount of repentance is the person who will not forgive everyone, every little thing. Then your Heavenly Father cannot forgive you. That's serious. That's serious, isn't it? We are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. We should walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness. That should be a, a hallmark of our anointing, of forgiving people. I want to cover five areas this morning. Uh, if you were going to uh, furnish a house, wouldn't it be the first thing you do is you want to lay out of the house? If I'm going to furnish a house, I want to know what the rooms look like and where things go. And I believe uh, we have people from around the world constantly saying, I saw this on YouTube, I saw this piece and that piece and that piece. And I want to learn that, but they don't know where it belongs. I want to give you a big picture outline. And if you're a note taker, I would write these down. Because in the days ahead, they're going to be amplified, clarified, and experienced by you, individually and corporately. Here's the five elements. Are you ready? Number one, holiness. Personal holiness. We've already seen it begin to emerge, and the fruit of it has begun several months ago. There's a, it's a topic that will be covered again and again and again. And we're going to have the balance between holiness and love. You need both. Now, the second element that I feel is going to be extremely significant in the days ahead is there's going to be revelations going to come to the body of Christ as to the body of Christ. We've treated the body of Christ like an option. And that's going to change radically in the days ahead. The body of Christ is that corporate expression of whom Jesus loves. And that's going to be the preparation of His bride. And if you don't have a love for your brothers and sisters, but you say you love God, that's a level of deception that's going to have to come off, isn't it? That's impossible. Um, <clears throat> so I see... That holiness is the first element that's going to be reinforced and experienced. The second experience, I believe you're going to experience a unity you never knew before. And I know that I know God gave Jennifer and I a foretaste of that uh, 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 10 or more years ago, right? 20 years ago maybe almost. And it was, we were praying without saying a word and meditating on God, but we're sitting side by side and we yielded to each other as well as yielding to the Lord. And all of a sudden, the presence of God came ushering in in a way that was 
unusually powerful, and we both blurted out a scripture simultaneously. Jennifer said, this is one accord, and I blurted out, this is two or more gathered. So the nature of that presence was depicted by his word. His word and his nature match. And that's exactly what he was doing. And uh, I won't get into the long story, but we went to a church in Greer after that. And all of a sudden, we saw the manifestation of what that kind of unity can do. And that's just with two. How much more with a company of people? Hmm? I'm believing that, that God is saying, holiness first, a unity that's going to surprise you. It's going to be a love knitting of greater and lesser knittings. And it's not going to be your likes and your dislikes. It's going to be the Holy Spirit. The third element is he's raising up mature leaders, mothers and fathers to handle the harvest. Mothers and fathers that are going to be like the sons of Zadok who can teach the people the clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy. There's a need for that right now in the body of Christ, even amongst teachers in general. That third element of maturity or full stature coming into mothers and fathers. We need mothers and fathers to raise the harvest. We don't need children raising children, right? And it's going to be a turning of the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers to make ready a people prepared for what God wants to accomplish. The fourth element, and this is something that Jennifer and I spend every day in prayer. We pray in the morning and we pray at night together in the same room. And then we compare notes. Usually I ask Jennifer what she senses, what she feels. I don't tell her what I'm getting to see if she's corroborating. Been doing that with her for years. All right. That way I can't be wrong and she can always uh, be corrected. <laughs> All right. No. But anyway, the fourth element is I know that I know experientially. He's not lifting that subject from our hearts. Is a revelation of the Father. We've had in times past, obviously, a revelation of Jesus, a revelation of the Holy Spirit, but now is the season for the revelation of the Father, an unfolding of His Father heart so that He could bring many sons unto glory. That's ultimately the purpose. And the, the uh, revelation of the Father is also going to bring a people, a remnant, a portion, a company, even an unnamed company, like when Jesus said, I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knee. I don't know who those people are, but I want you to be them people, right? Yeah. That's poor English, but I want you to be one of them, right? Mm -hmm. 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to the enemy, that have not compromised. All right, but that revelation of the Father is going to be a level three. It's like they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. You can be a baby Christian and be overcome by the blood of the Lamb and get saved. Level two is that it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, to where that fusion is so real that everything is outside of us. You no longer think in terms of me. You think in terms of we. It is Christ in me, the hope of glory. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. That's only level two. Level three is they love not their lives unto death. That is when all of a sudden suffering has nothing to do about you and your situation. You look at the challenges in life as those obstacles to overcome, to take up and bear up that which is lacking in the body of Christ. Your love for the body is so great. You see, we're going to have to improve on that body concept, aren't we? People won't be willing to do that level if you don't even care about the body of Christ, right? That's going to change. The fifth level is a company of reformers. Revivals are nice. I love revivals, but the fifth level is what is necessary. We need to impact society and the church. I believe there's going to be a level of reformers that are going to, that are going to stand for the genuine work of the cross in the church, and they're not going to compromise. And they're going to move into those areas that other people don't want to touch, and they're basically going to say, this is enough's enough, the status quo has got to go. Those are going to be the five areas. I wanted to give you the big picture because we're giving bits and pieces of all of this because there's essential how-tos in all of these as to how to approach intimately with God and how to uh, come into the place where we make progress in all of these areas. So, let's pray. So, 
Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you who began a good work are going to continue that good work in us. And this is a day where I believe you want us to reveal to us even the pathway to the Father's glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And that is, in fact, the title. If you're going to furnish a house, you need to lay out the rooms. You need to know where to place the furniture. Well, I believe there's a path and a destination for the followers of Jesus. You know, Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous is like a shining sun, and it shines ever brighter until the perfect day. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you hard messages, and then you're going to applaud like you always do, right? <laughs> I'm serious. This is not going to be easy. This is the, this is the starting place. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34, and I'm using the message translation. Think straight. Awaken to holiness in life. No more playing fast and loose with resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thing go on for as long as you have? Don't you love the message sometimes? I'll tell you, it's just... Acts 2.38, New Living Translation. Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. And my favorite to show that it's a continual lifestyle of repentance. Matthew 4, 17 from the One New Man translation. From then on, Yeshua began to preach and to say, you must continually repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, the One New Man Bible emphasizes continuously, and we've shared that again and again. Because the will of God was meant to be like a river, it was meant to be a flow. It wasn't to be a bunch of do's and don'ts, it was meant to be a, an obedient relationship that flows like a river. It's a constant. That's how you pray unceasingly, rejoice always, habitually believe good things, habitually, faithfully, continuously. We need that in an understanding that we are joined to the Lord, one spirit with Him, and it's a continuous flow. All right, so I want to cover <clears throat> some things that I believe we have to say. Here's some of the things that I need to say, and you need to say these things too. There's no placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ unless there is repentance from known disobedience. And I believe we're entering into a time and a season where you must speak the truth in love. You know, re recently uh, someone brought up the subject of, you know, uh, speaking the truth in love, if you don't speak the truth, you're not in love. There's no love in holding back and saying nothing. And you know, after pastoring for all these years, I used to do it, I was guilty of it, I think I'm gonna quit doing it. And one of those things is that when someone says God said, and you witness something different, we have a tendency to back off. I feel, I think I'm gonna start speaking up. If somebody says, God told me and I, and I don't witness that, I'm going to say I don't witness that. If they're, if they're in my jurisdiction, if it's anything uh, to do in my sphere, my realm of influence. Don't you think? Would you do that for your children? Yeah, you would. Your children said, God told me I don't have to clean my room. What would you say, Mom? <laughs> huh? Would you buy that? Would you just back away because they said God said? Would you? I don't know. The, the thing that uh, I want to hit this morning is we cannot be a follower of Jesus and continue to look at pornography. If you're watching by a Ustream or YouTube, that applies to you if you are considered part of the body of Christ. You can't continue in these things. You cannot be a follower in Jesus and have sex with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. These are the things that are not said often enough. Do you agree? Huh? You cannot be a follower of Jesus if you're going to gossip and slander people. And people don't know what, what's a prayer request and what is gossip. Let me tell you. If you are not part of the problem or the solution, it's gossip and it's slander. 
It's getting quiet in here. You cannot be a follower of Jesus if you're going to be selfish and greedy. You cannot be a follower of Jesus if we're going to be worry habitually. I was appalled. I saw somebody on Facebook said, I worry all the time. And their friends, of course, it's not the place to get theologies on Facebook. And their friends said, oh, that's okay. That's normal. That is not spiritually normal to be a worrier. If you, it takes less energy to pray. It takes more energy to worry. What do you mean? Worry is okay? The scripture says, be anxious for nothing but by prayer. Anxiety is fear-based. That's the wrong kingdom altogether. Worry, you're back separated from God. Even as a believer, what you've done is you've come outside of that union and you've been pulled into the world of circumstances. The world, the flesh, and the devil pulled you out from that union. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and refuse to forgive. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without pursuing holiness. Um, there's a term uh, that's been used, I call it a, a false Jesus, another Jesus, and uh, is it John Bevere? called it a knockoff Jesus. I like that term. What's a knockoff, girls? When they make a fake purse, that's a knockoff off the genuine? That's a pretend, a pretend version of something expensive. What would be a knockoff watch? You know, something that looks like a Rolex, but it's not a knockoff. It's fake, it's false. And I believe that we're in the time of purifying the church by purifying our hearts individually. Now, we know the danger. The danger is legalism, is the one side you fall into the ditch, and the other side is in response to, I don't want to get into legalism, you go into license to where everything goes. I'm more concerned that the church has leaned too far toward license. Where there's legalism, actually that can be corrected. You teach them how to forgive and how to repent and how to enter into the grace of God and the goodness of God and into the love of God. They need love, but they need love with truth. And you're not loving them saying nothing. That's got to go. That's got to end. All of these issues on sexual orientation need to be addressed. If Scripture says they're not to be, they're not to be. And fortunately, if ever there was a group of people that know what to do, if a person falls into that type of situation, all of the sexual issues, we've seen people get their life reorientated back to the way God created them in a short period of time. So it's not like we're not offering a solution how to deal with your issues and die to your agendas. Everyone that's been with me any more than a year has heard that over and over again. We're going to teach you how to die to your issues, your sin issues. <laughs> and how to die to agendas. You know what an agenda is? It's idolatry. It's something you want more than God. And it's something that you put out there to where you can't let it go. I want what I want, and I want it now. If we select only limited parts of the New Testament, we've created a false Jesus or a knockoff version. You can't cut out parts of the Bible. We have a large portion that call themselves Christians who believe everything in the Bible except all of the issues on sex. They're like sexual atheists. They believe in God except for the sexual areas. I believe that what God's going to do is bring us to the place where we're seeking the real thing. We want reality, we want holiness, and we want the love of God that goes with the holiness. No matter the audience, the only true gospel requires first repentance from all known sin and second, a turning to God. Let's look at, eventually we're going to get into the six deadly seas and watch them be totally eliminated from our life. And actually the children in the wilderness, 
engaged in all six of those deadly seas. I'll bet you most of you have them memorized by now. Hmm? You don't covet, compare, compete, conceal, complain, control. Six, the number of flesh. When those things have been eradicated from your life, then by the grace of God, you're in union and communion with Him. But think about it, even gossip. If you're not part of the problem and you're not part of the solution, what are you sowing? And what about when Paul dealt with the Corinthian church? What did he deal with? He dealt with sexual immorality. And he says, for this reason, many of you are sick and weak among you even the innocent ones. Think about that one. See, it's getting quiet. We need this. Even the innocent people, the church was had division because they failed to properly discern the body of Christ. But as soon as they dealt with intentional sin, things turn around. Now, for the benefit of the ones that are, that are feeling heavy right now, because I can feel it in the atmosphere, if a person is in, trapped in a sin and they are repenting regularly from their heart, that's not a person living in intentional sin. That's a person pursuing God, working through their difficulties. All right? That's a different category, isn't it? Amen. Now some people are like, oh, <laughs> Intentional is what brings a curse to the rest of the body. Intentional. So you didn't know that you can be affected by others. Hmm? Yep. So here's the, the first thing is recognizing those two perversions of grace. When it talked about the Pharisees, they were legalists. And they came down hard on the rules and the regulations. And basically they said, woe to you, Jesus said, woe to you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces and you won't go in yourselves. And yet you do not let others enter in either. I mean, they couldn't do what they were telling others to do. The definition of grace is the presence of Christ within working in our lives so we can obey God's commandments and meet His standard of holiness and love. Holiness and love. Legalism is to focus on the letter of the law while neglecting the grace of God. If you hear something and it sounds too hard, all right, especially from us, it's you're not opening to the grace of God who is enabling you and empowering you to obey it. This isn't something you try to do. This is something you surrender to and allow the grace of God to operate in you. For it is God who is able to will and to perform according to His good pleasure. I'm not after numbers. I'm after a company of people who are going to be able to reform the status quo and bring the power back to the church that's been missing. Hmm? So, legalism, harsh, controlling, hurtful. Legalism is possibly the cause of more believers turning away. You know people like that, right? You know a large percentage of people, they were believers at once, and they just got turned off at church. A lot of times it's because they didn't know Him intimately through relationship. They just heard what I was supposed to do and tried to do it and got totally frustrated and said, I can't do that. Well, guess what? You can't. That's why you're supposed to have an intimate relationship with God. Anything else? And they just kind of drop out of church. License, that's the hyper grace message that says we don't need to repent or forgive after we've been saved. And you can win a lot of converts like that, but the fact is, are they really Christian? Are they really converts? Because converts are supposed to be disciples. When do, you, when do you tell them that there's a work of the cross? There's a price to pay to be a follower. 
And Jesus did not lower the standard, Jesus raised the standard. So let's make it harder. Well, how do you make it harder? Well, it's because then I need grace to live it, right? I can't do it in my physical strength, striving. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will by no means from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men shall also be called least in the kingdom. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees. But I say to you, Everyone who so much as looks at a woman with evil desire for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Jesus didn't just say, thou shalt not commit adultery. He elevated it to a heart matter. That if you even look in your heart, you commit. I'll tell you what, you know what that tells me? That tells me you need grace. That needs grace. And where does, who does grace come to? A humble I have to get to the point where I can't do this and not quit church because I can't do it, but rather yield and depend upon Him for a deeper, fuller, richer, intimate relationship that apart from Him I can do nothing. And you will find a satisfaction that you've never known before. Some time ago the Lord had me repeat it in various services and I'm going to repeat it again. He said, in hindsight, He showed me my intimate relationship with God spelled out from beginning to where it needs to go. And I believe this is for every believer if you don't stop at any one level. The first thing He taught me was basically when you close your eyes and drop down to your spirit, you touch me. And you, when you touch me, you know that it's real and you have an inner assurance that you met spirit to spirit, face to face, really. Spirit to spirit is face to face, heart to heart, breath to breath. But it says once you touch the reality in that relationship, if you pursue it, you don't want a touch from God. You don't want to just go conference to conference trying to get something new and a touch. You want that touch to be transformed into an embrace. And God showed me where I learned to embrace Him to such a point that my frustration was I, I didn't want to leave my special prayer time to go to work when God basically said, because you want that embrace so much, I'm going to teach you how to maintain. You don't go in and out of prayer. You're going to stay in prayer and practice my presence. It'll be different at work than it is in your private time, but it's an embrace that is maintained. And it's, to me, it's the lost art of abiding. You, I went from touch to embrace, but you can stop at touch. You can live 30 years as a Christian for a little touch of God here and there always looking for a little burst of excitement. Or you can enter into that embrace, and that embrace does something supernatural that nobody, nobody can explain it. It needs to be experienced. Once that embrace becomes more and more constant, more and more of an abiding presence, there produces a satisfaction that many believers do not even understand. There is a realm of satisfaction in relationship that very few experience because they're too intermittent. I don't know about you, but let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Let, let me feel his warm embrace. I want the embrace. Kisses are intermittent. I don't want intermittent relationship. I don't want ups and downs. I don't want one day I'm flying high and the next day I'm bummed out. That's childishness. I want that that intermittent to move to an embrace and I want that embrace to produce what it's supposed to do and it produces a supernatural satisfaction. You can have this in your marriage, you can have this in your friendships, you can have this in your relationship with Jesus. A satisfaction. But you know what that satisfaction does? Once you're satisfied there is a tendency to have a God confidence and you don't need to worry about your self esteem. You're not working on you. You're confident in I am what I am by the grace of God and I like me. And say that without arrogance. Say it out of a God confidence instead of a trying to get self-confident. Actually, you should have no confidence in your flesh. 
If you're saying, I'm a failure, yes, you are. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Why not just resolve it and quit belly aching? Right? Next time you feel like a failure, let's just say, I am. I've been trying to do this without Jesus. No wonder. Apart from him, I can do nothing. So from this place of embrace, I've seen people stop at the embrace. And they got a satisfaction. And, but they, in this satisfaction, it's their relationship and they don't share it with anybody else and they have no desire. But the next step of true satisfaction is it points it to an overflowing heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, out of the abundance of, out of the overflow, let your love abound more and more. Let it overflow. If you are secure and satisfied and found a satisfaction in God, then your ministry can flow out of the overflow. Isn't that what ministry should be? Out of the overflow of what's real to you, not something that you heard someone else say, not an echo, but a voice. And it's the voice of God having worked in you, the Word having worked. All right, so now it's overflowing. And what's, what's it doing? It's overflowing. What's it pointing to? This is the revelation that's going to come to the body of Christ. That abounding love is pointing to the heart of the Father. What happens when you let that overflowing love as mature mothers and fathers pour out? Do you know what it ultimately will do? Not get hung up on your childish dreams and visions, and it is childish. I've got a dream to do this, and I've got a vision to do that, and I've got a... In reality, the purpose that you were created was to be a vessel for God to bring many sons unto glory. The heart of the Father points towards the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father points toward bringing sons unto glory. There's your eternal purpose. All of these courses on your dream and your purpose, most of them pertain to you. And it's fine. But you know what? If you got into God's eternal purpose to bring sons unto glory, your individual thing would fall into place better than anything you could have ever done on your own. When you weren't seeking me, myself, and I, you were seeking the eternal purpose of God to bring many sons unto glory. But you can't bring sons unto glory if you don't have the Father's heart. You can't bring them until you're at the level to where you are bearing in your body Death worketh in me so that life might work in someone else until that attitude is normative. That's not normative. We're at all different levels in the church, aren't we? That's not the normal attitude. I just can't wait to have a challenge knowing that as I overcome it, it's going to benefit someone else somehow. <laughs> wow. Can you see that? That was the Lord showing me the progression of my intimate relationship with Him. And yet that should be everybody's. I had to look in hindsight to see where it was taking me and why my mindset was the way it was. You were created to be filled with His Spirit and walk like Jesus walked. Uh, holiness, I'll tell you, we were created to be containers, vessels, servants, branches, temples with no independent life. Am I going to get applause after this? I think it's worthy of applause. No independent life. And you people are not free. I preach to the left. All right? This applies to you as well. No independent life. It is no longer I to live. See, they like that over here. Because they say, now he's looking at those people. <laughs> right? Sin is a spirit, and it infected the world, but Christ made us alive who were dead. The spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Now, unsaved people, sons of disobedience, the spirit that works in them, what spirit is it? Sin. This is, this is not rocket science here. So, even when they think they're doing what they want to do, who's really controlling? Prince of the power of the air. It's controlling them to do what he wants them to do, and they think it's their idea. 
I always used to tell my, I can still remember when I got saved, my drug buddy came and called me up and he heard that I had written a little testimony book. He goes, is my name in there? That's all he cared about. <laughs> is my name in there? <laughs> no, he said, no, your name's not in there. Although you are in there. <laughs> But God's basically taken us to the place where only God is holy and Christ in us living his holy life through us is what we should be pursuing. You can't do this. If this message sounds too hard, you're missing the relationship of God that through humility gives grace to the humble, right? You humble yourself, surrender, surrender, yield, and when you do, it's God who is at work to will and to perform. It's supposed to sound too hard. You're supposed to not think you can do it. That's why if you think, oh, I'm a basically good person. I've lived the Ten Commandments. I haven't murdered anybody. I didn't kill you. Did you ever want to? That's covet. <laughs> well, then you're guilty. If you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of the whole thing. Did you ever want to? That nailed me as a young Christian when I heard that covet means did you want to? So we've probably done all, we've broken all the Ten Commandments, haven't we? Because even if you think you didn't do it in action, thought, word, and deed, same thing. But did you ever want to? Well, we're going to get clean in here today. <laughs> do you see the danger of intentional sin, though? Do you see the danger of not speaking the truth in love? And if you've got a friend who says they're a believer and they're in, in a constant state of sin, sexual or otherwise, and you don't say anything, don't tell me you love them. Oh, well, just back off, you know. They said they're okay with God. That blood's on your hands, and you're not a friend. That spirit that works in the sons of disobedience, you know what? When Jesus died on the cross to give us a new spirit, So understand holiness? Are you going to applaud on holiness? Yes. You're not afraid? No. Whoa. This is good. I'm just going to, I'm going to hit the other five then. I don't know how far we're going to get. <laughs> if you can handle the holiness and sin, which we don't talk about in church, we do here. We need, we need more space, so we're going to clear this place out. All the, all the faint-hearted ones that want to stay in their sin will leave. I am not trying to build numbers. I want to purify a company who's going to be reformers. They're going to stand up and one will chase a thousand to ten thousand. I want everyone in my congregation to be, if God was going to brag and say, I've got seven thousand in Fort Mill. I've got fourteen thousand. I have not bowed their knee. I expect you people to be included in that, right? Amen. You don't need to be named individually. You need to know in your heart, that's me. He's talking about me. Don't you want them to brag on you like that? I do. Okay, the second element, unity. This unity is going to come as we begin to release the kind of attitude toward the body of Christ that we need. We need to get to the point where I believe what God showed Jennifer and I a long time ago is that part of the strategy is going to be like Gideon's army not only raising in a company, but it's the people who are going to be actually like the Moravians. You don't have to be perfect people, but the Moravians had, had an idea. In the essentials, unity. The non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, love. The love mixed with the essentials. What are the essentials? Well, the Apostles' Creed. The essentials means that you can't modernize the Bible because culture is moving in that direction. It's got to be biblically based unity. And that's going to be the unity of the faith, coming into the knowledge of the Son of God. Otherwise, it's a knockoff, isn't it? Otherwise, as a matter of fact, my leaders, I think, I think all of you should read John Bevere's uh, latest book on kryptonite, Killing Kryptonite. If you don't read that as an essential, you don't even know where the church is going. I really believe it. That's important. Everybody hear that? So all my leaders, it's mandatory. <laughs> they're, they're so afraid of me when I say mandatory. My leaders have a want to. 
Church people, you want to know what they're reading? Get it. But it basically just covers the holiness aspect of it. I want to get to the, to the unity. The unity is that God's preparing an army. And he showed me a long time ago that even the enemy is fears the loaf. Remember? One can chase a thousand, but two, ten thousand. Gideon's army were tested at the water of the word. But when they came together, even the enemy said, there's a loaf of barley bread. That was the dream. A loaf of barley bread has rolled in and destroyed our camp. Truly, this must be Gideon. And this, right? So how did Gideon win? As a loaf. To be a loaf means you get rid of the leaven. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. This is a loaf. Probably stretched the illustration there a little bit, but anyway. Uh, you get the idea. Individual sin affects the whole body. Achan did, and you know what? The children of Israel suffered until they found out what was going on here. Unity is going to include new revelation on the body being connected, and we need to be open to that kind of an appreciation of whatever God reveals in the days ahead. Fresh new awakening. The third element, mothers and fathers, God gave this to us. He's raising up teachers in the body of Christ. I don't care if it's a home group teacher or if you're a business person, you need to be able to have the same elements that the sons of Zadok had. And that was basically that you in your personal life minister to God. The fat and the blood, blood for the sin, fat for the glory of the kingdom will come. No sweat. That means you walk in the peace of God to where you're not striving. Ministry that causes you to strive. You cannot trust God and be striving at the same time. If you're perspiring doing the work of the Lord, there's something wrong. The priests of the Lord enter into the presence of God. It is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. It shouldn't require sweat. Now, teach God's people the difference between the holy and the unholy. Do you think we're in that time and season now? There's probably more heresies in the church now than uh, we've seen in a long time. There needs to be believers who are mature enough to teach this is holy, this is not holy. This is clean, this is not clean. As a matter of fact, when we minister to people in sexual sin, we have to use clean and unclean because if we use the word love and lust, they see everything as love. Even when they're lusting, they call it love. But if you bring it down to discern it in the spirit realm, clean or unclean. I've asked people who thought that they were okay in uh, sexual sin, and I said, drop down to your spirit. You tell me, does it feel clean or unclean? Oh. Your spirit knows truth from error, clean from unclean, right from wrong. Take it to Jesus. Don't take culture as your source. Take the Word of God as your source. God's going to cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean, and they're going to stand as judges, and they're going to make judgments. They're going to say, no, I don't witness that. No, living with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and saying you're a Christian, I don't witness that. That's sin. And if you can't do that, you don't love them. And don't say loving them is letting them go and watching and saying nothing. The fourth level, revelation of the Father. Not that the Father loves you, that's baby level. At some point, you're going to have to get beyond that and have that a settled fact that God loves you. It's basically that the Father's heart is in me to love other people through me. It's got to be the expression of the Father. What did Jesus give us an example? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? I only do what I see my Father doing. I only say what I hear. We need to raise up a company of people who operate that as normative, not as a, an occasional instance when they try. But they are trusting that there's been a supernatural exchange. And all three of these levels come through a definite work of the cross. It doesn't come by and uh, I'll impart it to you and you do nothing. There needs to be a deep repentance and a humility before the Lord and saying, I want to move to another level in my Christian walk. We've literally revolutionized portions of the church with the baby level. Did you know that? All of our books. 
We had to teach the church of Jesus Christ how to forgive from the heart. Because 90% were forgiving from the head. That's, I speak to you little children because your sins are forgiven. That's still baby level. Do you think the church has a way to go? I want to raise up a company of reformers. What's the second level? How many walking in the second level in this church? I know a lot of people have, have entered into it since in the last three months. Level number two was basically when all of a sudden there was a clear awareness that I am joined to the Lord and I am one spirit with Him and that even temptation, everything is coming from the outside of me and nothing is going to cause me to function apart from Him. It's a replaced life. It's, it is no longer I that live but Christ. It's the young man. I speak to you young men because you've overcome the wicked one and the Word as a person, not Bible knowledge, the Word abides in you. And it's strong and you've overcome the wicked one. You walk in victory and temptation is always to pull you out from that relationship. You, const, you live in a constant we, not me. We. Whatever happens, happens to us. Are you walking in that consciousness? That's a strong level too. Strong level two is a replaced life where it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. This life I live in the flesh, I live by faith. But if 90% of the church still needs to know level one forgiveness, we've got a ways to go. We're going to need to prepare for an awakening. But these are the steps to prepare for what God is going to do in the days ahead. That awakening comes, who knows? Some of the people might get their lives head on their shoulders properly. <coughs> Nevertheless, you could also miss it too. He who has seen me has seen the Father. I am in the Father and the Father in me, the words that I speak. That revelation of the Father is one of total self-giving to where you look at trials and tribulations, which we've been, there's a three series message we just did on how to deal with challenges in life, how to overcome. This is a different mindset. This is a mindset that the challenges in life I'm being poured out as a sacrifice, knowing it's going to help others. Death worketh in me, that life worketh in others. Most people, when they get a challenge, just, oh, look what happened to me. When you say, look what happened to me, you have stepped out of that union and communion, and you decided to operate independently. It happened to us. Everything that happens to you happens to us. Now, I expect a great deal of applause after this message, being it is so non-demanding and easy. Does it sound hard? Come on, the consciousness that I'm talking about, you know you're not there, right? How do I get there? I humble myself and yield and surrender and say, I need a genuine work of the cross because I can't do that in and of myself. I need Jesus desperately. And I need to reach my potential in God. The potential is far exceeding anything that we've seen. And don't compare yourself amongst yourselves because we'll all look good. Right? There's always somebody worse. Right? Oh, thank God I'm not like Ralph, you know. No, you compare yourself to Jesus and get set free. That's the revelation of the Father. Revelation of the Father is going to bring us into the place of a company of breakthrough reformers. God has given us this promise that what Gideon did is in that unity, in that maturity, they, there was a, a breakthrough into the enemy's camp, but they won the battle within and they won the battle without, and they even, they even won the battle for the sake of the rest of Israel. They let them join into the spoils. They were a company of reformers, a company of breakthrough believers. That's Kingdom Life Church. Don't sign up for this if you're not serious. I don't want easy believism. I've watched too many people fall by the wayside with the bait of an easy message. It's so easy you don't even have to be saved to do it. If you hear a message like that, it's too easy then, isn't it? 
I need Jesus and I need to humble myself and I need the grace because I can't do it legalistically. Right? And I think if there was ever anything to show me I can't do it legalistically, I think we covered it uh, some time ago um, from uh, the One New Man Bible. Try to do this in the flesh. Go ahead, I dare you. From then on, you begin to preach and to say, you must continually repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. You must continually seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. You must regularly ask that it will be given to you. You must continually seek and you must find. You must knock habitually. You must continually be imitators of God as beloved children. You must walk constantly in love. You must <laughs> continually come to and Continually drink of the living water. You must habitually give attention to prayer. You must continually watch out for the ministry. You must constantly be watchful. You must stand fast in the faith, habitually conduct yourself in a courageous way. You must continually increase in strength. Always be rejoicing. Come on, just do that one. Always be rejoicing. Come on, who, who's there? Always be rejoicing. You must pray unceasingly. Continuously give thanks in everything. You must habitually not ever quench the spirit. You must continually not ever despise prophecy. You must constantly prove all things. You must of necessity hold fast that which is good. You must faithfully keep yourselves from every form of evil. And then I like to quote John Wesley who said, Your will be done continually without interruption. That's relationship. You can't do none of these things that I preach today. You want to go into legalism? Fine. But you'll just, you'll just frustrate yourself, humble yourself, and cry out to God, and hopefully then you can do it right. You need grace. But grace is the personal presence of Jesus enabling you and empowering you to not sin and to be all that he called you to be and to do all that he called you to do. Wow. That's what grace is. But who does he give grace to? The humble. Are you willing to say that you're really not walking anywhere near what God had planned for you? Not even anywhere near? If 90% of the church still forgives from the head, when Matthew 18 says, unless you forgive from the heart, that's, that's little children. Your sins are forgiven. And I'm telling you, God is telling me that we're going to see all three levels in the awakening. But these three levels are approached only through the cross of Jesus Christ. You, there has to be a denying of self. You can't kill self. self. You'll always be a self. But you can deny yourself for the lordship of Jesus to rise up in you. Does that sound good? All right. Then I'm believing that we're going to enter into that fifth stage of the greater works the revelation of the Father, but the revelation of the Father is going to bring us into a place to where we take a whole new look at, at suffering. We're going to look at suffering from a totally resurrection point of view for the joy set before us. You can be so focused on the end result that you, you minimize, you consider light affliction the challenges in your life. Wouldn't you like to live there? You have challenges in life. I still say my mother had the best wisdom. Every time I murmured and complained, she said, Dennis, if this is the toughest thing you're ever going to go through in your life, you're going to have an easy life. And you know, that snaps you out of that self-pity. We need to get to the place where we consider the challenges in our life as light affliction compared to what, if we properly respond to it, what's it going to produce on the other side? I want to live on the resurrection side. I want to see that, that, that empowerment that comes on the other side of denying myself. There's as much of a total entry into a fully meaningful relationship with Jesus on this third level as an entry into the replaced life. It still must come through a denying of self and a work of the cross. Paul said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering on a sacrifice and service of your faith. I'm glad and I rejoice with you all. How many have that mindset? That's a consecration level that the Spirit can produce if you're willing to allow the work of the cross to have its way. If you're allowed to recognize when self has an agenda. Someone just mentioned that to me today. 
this morning when we started. We have a series called Deadly Agendas. That's going to come to the forefront for the church. Deadly Agendas are anything that you are reaching forward that you actually love more than God. And it could be ministry, and it can be education. It can be something that is not sin in and of itself. But an agenda is something that's not necessarily God-directed, but you're doing it primarily to feel good about yourself, justifying it and saying, God said. Well, next time God says something, tell one of my pastors, because they're all instructed to say, if they don't witness it, say, I don't witness that. Now, probably no one is going to ask us anything now. <laughs> the suffering at baby stage. I want you to hear this word suffering properly. When you're a baby, you hear suffering in, in the context of, to be real honest, a lot of it is unnecessary because of your sinful behavior, selfish behavior. So there's a lot of suffering that you bring on yourself. Unnecessary trials and tribulations. What, what part of that stands out to you? Unnecessary? <laughs> yeah. Unnecessary trials and tribulations because of a, a sinful pattern. But that's baby, baby stuff. We don't want to walk in that kind of a relationship. The next one is that all of a sudden I'm in that second level. And for me, suffering... Is, is basically resisting the outward pull of trying to get me out of my relationship with it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. My suffering now is not suffering against sin. My suffering is against the sin trying to get me to operate independently of Jesus. I am joined to the Lord. I am one spirit with Him. Does that make sense? It's a different attitude. It's a totally different concept. It's like the world, the flesh, and the devil is trying to pull me out, all right? Like, I, my, like, like my addiction to donuts. It's a habit. Addiction is a habit on steroids, all right? My habit for donuts. What does it work? I'm one spirit with Jesus, but desires and appetites rise up, and they draw me away. What happens when they draw me away? The bucket starts to go up. They draw me away. But if I go, oh, Jesus, then I can have one donut instead of a dozen. <laughs> so moderation, because I went to him. And greater is he that's in me than he is in the world, right? But God's basically going to bring us to that company of breakthrough believers, a group of instruments of reformation, nameless reformers who are basically going to be part of a corporate entity that is going to be able to change things in the marketplace, change things in the church. And we're going to address those things. Let's seal that right now. Father, I'm a candidate for this process and I am welcoming the work of the cross. I am welcoming to humble myself and say, man, I can't do none of those things that he said continually, constantly, I can't even think constantly. <laughs> I receive forgiveness for having tried to live this life and justify my sin. This is for the benefit of you streamers mostly. I receive forgiveness for being duped into a knockoff Jesus because I've listened to my friends and the culture who told me that I can do all of these things and still be a Christian. Contrary to the Word of God, particularly in the sexual areas, I receive forgiveness and cleansing right now. And God's going to start putting you in a... And you need to get acquainted with healthy people. You don't need to hang around the same kind of people who are in the bad shape just as much as you were. Come out from among them. Find people that are healthy to associate with in Jesus' name. Level number two. Oh, pastor, I walk in a lifestyle of forgiveness and repentance. I don't have aught against anyone. If I have aught against anyone, I instantly release forgiveness and allow it to flow. If that's you, then let's go to the second level and say, I want 
an exchange of that spirit. There's no longer a good dog, bad dog fighting on the inside of me. It's basically when he died, I died. And it's a replaced life to where it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. I yield to that work of the spirit right now for a replaced life. That it's basically joined together a new spirit, a new heart. In all temptation to sin is going to be coming from the outside pulling me to get out of that replaced life. Even my own desires and appetites that rise up in me are trying to pull me out from that union and I will not give in to that. I yield to the Lordship of Jesus within me. It is no longer I that live but Christ that lives with me. I want to enter into that work of the cross to where I have the Father's heart, to where I see even challenges and suffering in my life as working in me a greater work of glory for the kingdom of God and for others. I welcome that work of death to, to deny myself and basically honor the Father's heart flowing through me to only do what I see my Father doing and only say what I hear my Father saying and to love as he loved. To see others is not, not even God and others, but to see God, even looking at others as, as these are the objects of whom God loves. It's going to be God, all in all, out of my heart, out of a father's heart, let it flow. How many are challenged that you want that? How many really want that? It's going to be a work of the cross. You can't just get an impartation. However, I've seen people get into the exchange life by impartation. Jennifer did, except she cried out for it for two years. But nonetheless, let's, let's just seal this work that you who begun a good work is going to continue this. And we're going to see these levels developed over the years ahead. I wanted to give you the big picture because all of those are, are significant parts of the whole. And when the awakening comes, there's going to have to be a company of people that can move forward. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.